Welcome to the Tales of Success podcast, a show about Labradors and achieving training success. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Tales of Success podcast with me, Vicky Sharp. First of all, I'm so sorry it's been a couple of weeks since the last episode. I've got a new puppy in the house and that has been keeping me pretty busy for the last few weeks. So the little pup is called Ellie and she is a gorgeous little fox red lab. And in those two weeks, we've had a crazy time settling her in taking care of toilet training, crate training, and lots of socialization for her. The breeder that I got Ellie from was a first-time breeder, but um, that didn't put me off at all. Even though it was their first time, I was really, really happy to use them because they were such a great example of what good breeding and aftercare should look like from, from Labrador breeding. And I've invited that breeder, Anna, to join us today to tell us about her experience with breeding from their pet Labrador. Anna, hello, welcome to you. Hello. Right. I'm going to go straight into the important stuff. And Whenever I have a guest, I like to make the episode as much about the dogs as possible. So start off by telling us about the wonderful Millie. So Millie is two years old. She's a fox red Labrador. She is very lovable, very cheeky, um, very quick to learn. And she... If she doesn't want to do something, <laughs> she won't do it. <laughs> it's, it's hard to make her, but she she picks everything up so quickly. We've done lots of different types of training with her. So we've done obviously Tales of Success Foundations training and the scent training too. And we've also done quite a lot of gun dog work with her as well. Um, and she takes everything in her stride. She's great. I can vouch for that, that she's a quick learner. She's probably one of the quickest learners that we've had at any of our training, that's for sure. Um, and I... The bits that I've seen of Millie, she seems to be very happy when she is doing stuff. Um, where would you say she is at her happiest, whether that's a, a physical location or a certain activity? Where's she at her happiest? I think there's two places. One is when she's invited up to sleep on the bed in the morning. Um, very happy about that. She's not always allowed as well, so it's, it's a big treat. And the second is leaping into water. She absolutely loves water. She, well, for the first few months, she didn't like it at all and we took her on a doggy swimming lesson which didn't even know they were a thing but <laughs> but we did and ever since then we can't keep her out of it and you, you'll well if anyone follows us on Instagram you'll see her diving that she does into the water as well it's quite dramatic. <laughs> so um, you said also as well she loves swimming and she's pretty good at learning as well so Millie is a fox red lab and she's from working lines right? Yes yeah her dad is a working Labrador uh, her mum isn't but um, a, lot, a lot of the lines are working. Okay. And although you do some gun dog stuff with her and you've done some scent work with her, is she predominantly a brilliant family pet or do you work her in any way? No, she hasn't worked. Um, but, you know, she definitely has the potential to if, if, she, if we wanted to in the future. Um, but she's just a family pet. She's just a great dog. And she just she loves lounging about on the sofa. And, and that's what it makes her so great. She just has that great off switch. Perfect. And what is the best bit about having Millie in your life? That's really difficult to pick one bit, I know. It is difficult. Um, I, I, can I say everything? You can say whatever <laughs> um, you like, yeah. We've only got like 20 minutes though. <laughs> <laughs> I think the best thing is um, the welcome home when, when you come back after a long day or even in the morning, even after just going to the toilet, to be honest, the welcome back is great. They just, they miss you so much and they always want to be with you, spend time with you and be a great companion on walks and everywhere really so you've got Millie as this amazing family pet and it sounds like she gives the best wet nose kisses and wacky tails <laughs> and all that stuff but you recently decided to breed her tell us a little bit about why that was and kind of what was your motivation and making that decision um it's always something I had wanted to do um I've always been obsessed with dogs <laughs> and we we just love Millie's temperament so much and we wanted to add another dog at some point and we just thought we would love a Millie puppy um so that's why we, we bred her initially is because we wanted that but also because I wanted to experience it and also I thought it would be good for her as well to experience motherhood um you know there's lots of research on why it's good for dogs to have one litter um no, they obviously don't need to but it is quite it can be quite good for them in a lot of ways so we just thought we would let her have a litter Although we want kind of, well, you said you wanted her to have a litter and experience it and you wanted to experience it. 
What research went into finding out whether she was actually suitable to breed and suitable to sort of carry on her lines? What what tests and research did you do there? First of all, we did all the health tests. So she was hereditary clear on all the DNA, the main things that um, Labradors can carry. Um, but we had to do an eye test and hip and elbow scoring as well. Um, so that involves getting x-rayed um, hips and elbows, sending them off to the, um, the BVA for them to score. And I think they have to be below a certain number for to be appropriate for breeding. Um, but also it isn't just about health tests. I think it's about the temperament of the dog as well. Millie is a really easygoing, calm. She's not anxious or nervous in any way, very sociable um, and, you know, really quick to learn. So they're the kind of characteristics that we'd want to pass on. And, you know, you'd want, you'd want out of a puppy. And we, you know, definitely wouldn't have bred her in any way if she had any characteristics where it wouldn't be desirable. And when you did your research into this, I guess you probably found out quite quickly that there are there are a lot of breeders out there that don't do health tests. So why in your mind was it important to do the health tests? Yeah, unfortunately, it's really easy to get a dog that's not been fully health tested because it's quite easy to just breed dogs. For me, it was really important that we weren't passing anything on to any puppies. You know, the, the risk, you know, Labradors specifically have higher propensity say that word um for hip and elbow dysplasia and so you know you don't want to pass anything on that could mean that her puppies wouldn't have a long and happy life and um so you know millie's a good temperament she's a healthy dog which is the most important thing but then you've got the other part to think about you've got to go and find a stud dog to be kind of the father to these dogs so how did you go about finding that dog and what did you look for when you were looking at their kind of temperament and characteristics so I think I must have looked at online about 30 stud dogs. I was being very picky. Um, first of all, I wanted another fox red because we wanted kind of a fox red colour. Um, well, it's technically yellow, isn't it? But dark yellow. Um, and we wanted them to move from working lines. Well, I just prefer the style of working line Labradors. Um, obviously, we love show Labradors as well, but just for us personally. We wanted to make sure they had all the appropriate health tests. That was a given. Obviously, didn't look at any studs that didn't have the health tests wanted balance hips you know zero zero elbows um really good scores and I didn't necessarily didn't necessarily have to be a working dog but you, you know when you get a working dog it shows that they're quick to learn um and clever and and loyal quite a lot of the time um so that's why I kind of went for a working dog and then for me I I weighed them all up. <laughs> I Well, I made a huge Excel table, actually, of all the different <laughs> scores, compared them all. And also the kind of inbreeding and that kind of thing. You obviously don't want anything that's too closely related to Millie. Um, and contacted a few of the owners. Um, and the lady that we did chose, she was absolutely lovely, really friendly and helpful. And although she was about three and a half hours away, um, we liked the look of that dog the most and thought that I would meet that one um, first. So we went to meet him and he was lovely and calm, really friendly, um, kind of what you want out of a dog. Obviously very well trained because he's a working dog, but he was just a really lovely dog. So we thought we'd go for him, but also we'd seen uh, on Instagram some of the puppies that he's produced and every puppy that he produced, I, I really liked the look of as well. And they were all really clever and um, really nice, just face shapes were really nice and body they just looked really like nice healthy labradors so that was another contributing factor um so yeah that's that's how we decided really and i think that's really nice that you were prepared to travel to the pretty much the other end of the country to to go to see the stud and, and do the mating process rather than just finding a dog that was local to you so you've really picked the right the right stud dog so when was the right time to go and visit this stud dog? Because I, from memory, I think Millie was in the middle of our scent detection program at the time, and you you did a late night dash down to the other end of the country, didn't you? Well, yeah. So we we wanted to make sure that we went on the exact day to get the kind of make make sure that Millie wasn't uncomfortable and we'd got the most out of the breeding. You don't want to go on the wrong day because obviously then it's done more likely to be unsuccessful. Um, so we did progesterone tests. So they take the vets, they take a bit of blood um, and they test it for the progesterone levels. And when they're in a certain range, um, that's when they're most fertile or they've just ovulated. So 
we went, I think, can't remember if I was off my head. I think it was, I think it was in day 12 we ended up going, but on the Friday before we went on the Monday, she tested and she was really low. So we thought, oh, we've got quite a while. And I rang the stud owner and she said, oh, you probably got another week or so. And then we thought, well, we'll just go back on Monday to the vets, do another blood test and, and see. And we went back and then they called me and it shot right up. So I was working. I probably shouldn't say this. And I was like, I wonder if I can skive off a few hours early <laughs> um, to drive down. Um, so we got in the car, drove three and a half hours down, we did the mating. And um, yeah, and then then we ended up staying the night and drove back in the morning. Um, we ended up only doing one mating. They often recommend two, like 48 hours apart. But we kind of decided with the stud owner, because she was in the later, she'd shot up quite quickly and she was the later the bit of the window we thought we'll just do one and see how it goes um because we don't want to put her through anything unnecessarily because if you know later in the stage and she is resistant you know we don't want to put her through that so yeah we ended up just doing one and obviously it was successful so we went at exactly the right time perfect and you please don't go into the fine detail with this next question but the mating process um was it kind of a natural thing and how was that for you as an owner and, and how was it for Millie? Um, yes, it, it was natural. You can do artificial insemination, but we they recommend the chemical recommends for the first mating that you do natural. Um, and I just thought, yeah, I just thought we'd, we'd try that first. <laughs> um, it wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. I won't go into the graphic detail, but you do get the, let the dogs get to know each other a little bit. Um, and it didn't actually last as long as I thought it would. And it really helps when you've got a stud owner who's very experienced. You know, she was she was she did everything really. I kind of stood there like, thank you. <laughs> um, so yeah, she she was lovely, and that, that's really important to have that. I think. Um, and she was gentle and patient with Millie, and that's the, you, you want them to be good with both dogs. Yeah, definitely. And um, so how long was it after the mating that you found out that Millie had caught and what, that she was pregnant? And what was that weight like? Because did you have um, any clues that she might be pregnant at that point? The longest wait of my life. Um, I think I was checking everything, every part of her <laughs> for any symptoms. So she became more clingy, quite tired. She she didn't have morning sickness, but I mean, I wouldn't expect it from her because she's pretty greedy. Um uh she, she did she was voluntarily healing all along the walks and I thought that's strange <laughs> um but a big thing as well she started being a little bit snappy towards dogs which is not normally um so it's definitely the hormones changing and by I think it was day 28 we ended we did a scan at that point I knew because her belly was a bit harder she'd put on weight her nipples were enlarged um it could have been a phantom and they often say that you know it, it definitely that is an option you know phantoms can be really realistic sometimes um, but I just felt like I, I know Millie very well, actually. <laughs> um, and I just, I just knew. So yeah, we were happy when we got the ultrasound. <laughs> and as the weeks went on and she was becoming kind of clearly, uh, pregnant with, with pups, how was she? Did she kind of carry on as normal right up to almost labor day or was she slowing down? Did you have to do anything different in those weeks leading up to, to when she kind of went into labor? The first four weeks, nothing really changed. She was still her normal self. Um, we still did the same amount of walks and everything. And and then as we got the kind of confirmed that she was pregnant, we started just taking her a bit easy. We didn't like send her to the dog walker at all. We just took her all the walks ourselves and um, just, just so we knew what was happening. Um, we didn't want to put her in any stressful situations. That's the main thing as well. You don't want them to be stressed because... I think up until later on in the pregnancy, the pups can be reabsorbed. Um, so you just want to take care of her as best as possible. You start upping her food at a certain time as well. Um, not too much to be fair, but we did we did it up her food. Um, yeah, just looked after her. I think I think in the last week she wasn't that keen at going out. We just did a few lead walks. We didn't really all really sniffy slow walks. Um, mm. She wasn't, she wasn't hugely bothered. She was more bothered about lounging around on the sofa. Um, in fact, I think she kept sighing. I think she was feeling a bit fed up at her size at the, by the end of it. Um, and yeah. in, in kind of that lead up, had you had a scan to see how many pups she was carrying? So we took her to our normal vets and they said at least five. And they don't have like the most up-to-date ultrasound equipment. So 
me being me, booked another scan because <laughs> um, I wanted to know exactly how many. And they, she found seven really easily. And she then she messaged saying she looked at the scans again and she thinks probably eight. Um, so yeah, we were going with about eight. Yeah. So once you find out you've got Millie and potentially eight puppies on the way, what preparations had you done prior to Millie going into labour? So I saw the setup that you'd got in your house with all this stuff. So just talk us through what your house was set up like in anticipation of these pups arriving um so we cleared our we wanted to clear a big space for Millie first of all we were trying to decide where to put the welcome box because often people put them in another room um away but kind of our downstairs area is all open plan so we didn't want to put her upstairs away from everything because we wanted the pups to be socialized with sounds and you know noises people in, in the kitchen and living area um so we decided we'd move the dining room table back and have like a big space for her. So quite a few weeks before she was even due to give birth, we put the welcome box in. We've ordered everything you could possibly think of. Um, a lot of it didn't get used. <laughs> a lot of medical equipment just in case. Um, really useful tools, a little aspirator thing, actually. Um, but a lot of stuff for the actual birth, a lot of towels, <laughs> um, some, a lot of vet bed. And then we kind of got more stuff as we went on as the pups got bigger um you know toys and bowls and that kind of thing enough for every eventuality um just in case really but then tell us about labor day so how did you know millie had gone into labor were the signs really obvious and what was the process from you noticing that she's gone into labor to you delivering the last pup because you did it all yourself didn't you yes we did uh, i would say johnny did more than me actually but i don't tell him that <laughs> It was about, so the the second scan that we had, they said that she was due on the 20th of May, like because she measured the size of the puppies um, and got to the 19th of May. I'd gone off to play netball. Johnny messaged me saying, Millie's panting and pacing. And I was thinking, oh no, she's, it's coming. Um, so I came back and she was panting and pacing. And um, then she was kind of settling for periods, but we were a bit... You know, being first time breeders, we were like, oh, is this, is, is this normal? So we had Johnny's sister, who is um, our vet, very luckily, on hand, on hand, um, we on the phone, that was. And so we'd update her and then, you know, just in case. <laughs> um, and that kind of went on all throughout the night. Um, we kind of took it in turns to sleep. I think I got more sleep than Johnny because I was actually working the next day. Um, but she kind of just went through periods of panting and pacing and then fell asleep for a little bit and then kind of did the same again. I felt really sorry for her at that point, actually, because she was obviously feeling uncomfortable. Um, and then she did all that throughout the morning as well. And it got to about 10 a.m. and her waters broke. And I thought, right, we're coming now. They're coming. Um, after not much sleep, you think, please just come now. <laughs> um, and then the first one arrived about 25 minutes after um after the waters broke, we'd called the vets actually about nine o'clock in the morning saying, you know, how long can this go on for this first stage of, uh, of labour? And I think it can go on to like 24 hours. They can like pace and pant for quite a while. And they said, as long as they're not pushing and contracting, that's when you need, you know, if they contract for long periods of time, that's when you need to kind of get, go into the vets. And she hadn't been pushing or contracting at all. But after her waters broke, she could, she was contracting. And at that point, we knew that it was visibly obvious she was contracting. because we kind of weren't sure what we were looking for to start with. Um, so yeah, she was contracting and then the first, the first pup came out, I think about half 10. Um, and it was a little girl first who's now called Roxy <laughs> and she wasn't in a sack and we thought, Oh, I thought they usually come in a sack. Um, but we helped her with that one. We kind of, we wanted Millie to do everything, but with the first one, I think she was a bit shocked by it. Um, we put it next to her. I think she kind of looked at me like, um, what is that? Um, <laughs> She's like, what, what's this new toy you've bought me? <laughs> um, and then we just kind of put them on the teats to, I think, is it colostrum or something? We could kind of get the milk flowing um, and just made sure they were clean. We rubbed them all, make sure they were warm, breathing, aspirate, get any fluid off their lungs. Um, and then they kind of came every every 45 minutes. I think one only came two, it only came five minutes apart. Um, and then we got to number seven and she came out in a green, like a greeny sack. And I was a bit worried because I thought green was kind of, um, like a distress, but it, I don't know. It can, there's, there's a lot of things to say, different kind of things. And she was absolutely fine anyway. Um, but she did the cord, her umbilical cord was kind of wrapped a little bit around her. So I think maybe it was her time to come out. Definitely. Mm. We just kept a close eye on her and she was fine. Um, 
but we let, kind of let Millie do quite a lot of it. Um, just we didn't we didn't let her bite too close to the umbilical to, to the we didn't let her let her bite the cord too close to the puppies um, because you, know, you can get where they bite too close and you don't want anything to happen. Um, and yeah, and then we after seven was done with I could I felt her tummy and I could feel another one. So um, we waited. I think it was about an hour and a half, and then the bait came out. Um, and then Millie went off to the toilet. She said she went for a sleep, and I thought, oh, she, she must be done. Um, let's clear up. <laughs> um, so we cleared, we cleared up all the towels, all the um, like all the we had some we had scissors, we had like all the iodine, you know, various bits. We had everything to be fair. We literally could have opened a shop. And then Johnny had gone off for a shower, and um, I went around to check on Millie, and looked at her back end and I was like oh my gosh it's another puppy and it, it was two and a half hours later and they often say if it's more than like you know two hours go to the vets um but obviously it's hard because you don't know how many you're expecting but I, I was so shocked that I just stood up so staring for a few seconds and I was like oh gosh right I need to do something um I had to quickly find all the things the aspirator and stuff um and that was that was Nancy and I think that was probably the reason we kept her because she was the surprise one um but yeah, so that, that was the shock. But it, it was an amazing experience to kind of watch how the mum just takes over and just knows what to do. So um, that, I mean, that that's really strange because obviously you didn't teach Millie to do any of that. That was just natural instinct very much kicking in. I mean, did all of her pups survive that birthing process? Yes. Yeah, they all came out. Um, I think they were all pretty much breathing. If there wasn't any that we, we, rubbed, we rubbed them so quickly that I wouldn't have known if it wasn't. Um, and we took all the fluid off their lungs with the aspirator. Um, and yeah, they were just all happy and healthy straight away, really. Um, we were really lucky. Hey, amazing. So nine healthy, happy little pups and a mum that did really well. What was her recovery like for Millie afterwards? Um, she didn't really want to leave the whelping box for a few days. Um, and she was passing placentas for a few days, which isn't particularly nice for her. Mm. We had to shower her a few times. Um and yeah, she didn't want to leave the box. So we had to feed her in her box. In fact, she was being an absolute princess. So I had to hand feed her, which is not like her. Um, but yeah, we had to encourage her to go out for a wee as well. We, we now know she can hold her wee for a long, long time. Um, so yeah, I think that's really common though. That, you know, they just had these puppies and they don't want to leave them. Um, when she first had, after, after a few hours, she kind of got out of the box and she just stood staring at them for a good 20 minutes. And I was like, what are you doing? Are you counting them? Are you just looking at them? I think she was just taking it all in. Um, and then she got back in the box and didn't really leave them for a few days. So it sounds like actually she was she was a good natural mother to them. Did you have to get involved as kind of the, the human caregiver at any point and, and kind of encourage her to do things? Or, you know, what did you have to do for those first few weeks to, to help her? Um, so the first few weeks is, I, I think, it's actually the easiest time, but the most the most stressful I found because it was so work the first two weeks are the most important in terms of that pup surviving. Um and it's just stressful making sure that none of them are getting squished is one of my main things. And they're all putting on weight and all healthy. So we'd weigh them daily. We didn't handle them loads because I don't think you meant to handle them too much at that point. You'd kind of let the mum do their thing. I did put the, the one that was a bit little bit smaller, um, I put her on the teeth a little bit more just to make sure she was growing and uh, increasing in weight. We'd weigh them every night. They were all, they all put on weight every day. They're all doing really well. Um, so yeah, we didn't get involved. We just kind of cleaned the area once a day um, and just made sure they were all doing well. We we did, I don't know whether you need to do this or not, but we slept downstairs for two weeks. We took it in turns. And we were probably being slightly overprotective, but every squeal, I was like, is everyone okay? <laughs> um, we did have the pig rails and everything to make sure that, nothing's getting squ- no one's getting squished and Millie was actually really careful but when there's nine of them she was like constantly trying to find her feet trying to get a, a, a place to sit down where because as soon as they smell her although they can't see or hear gosh they're quite good at squir- squirming over to get to the milk <laughs> <laughs> like going to an all-you-can-eat buffet for them isn't it it is yeah <laughs> so once you've gone through the mating we've gone through the labor and you've now got nine healthy happy puppies that you've fretted about for, for essentially a couple of weeks to start with and made sure they're continuing to be healthy. Obviously, you had no intention of keeping nine puppies, so you needed to find new homes for them. So tell us a little bit about that process of finding not just a home for them, but the right home. What did you do to make sure they were going to good homes? First of all, you know, kind of advertising in the right places. Um, so we used Champ Dogs um, because people come on there to just find fully health tested, kind of registered Labradors. 
not large Labradors, any any dog, but you know, particularly obviously familiar Labradors. Um, we actually advertised with just before they were born for people who wanted to be on a wait list. We obviously didn't know how many of which gender we were going to have. Um, we had a few people that we knew of interested anyway, just because they knew Millie. Um, but we just wanted to make sure they were going to the right home. So we asked people we didn't know to fill out a questionnaire um, or we met them for a walk in person um, just so they could meet Millie. And also it's not like it's about us finding the right homes, but also them thinking that Millie's one of Millie Pups is the right dog for them as well. Um, we had a few people come meet Millie. Um, I don't know how you couldn't love Millie if you come meet her, but <laughs> obviously I'm going to say that. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we just, I, I think the biggest thing for me was finding the owners and the homes is, is quite stressful because me personally, I feel like a huge responsibility to these puppies because, you know, I brought them into the world. So it's my responsibility to find them good homes and make sure that they're happy and healthy. Um, yeah, I still worry about them now <laughs> and they're all in their homes. So, yeah. <laughs> And um, how long were they with you for? So eight weeks is usually the time that they um, that they leave the breeder's house. So you were responsible for these puppies for eight weeks, right? The, the, I think four went on the eight week mark and then we had another kind of nine days where they were all kind of spaced out going every few days. Um, so it's quite nice actually to get to spend some time with less of them. When when a few, on the, on the Friday night after four of them had gone, I was having like five of them running around the kitchen and I was thinking, oh my gosh, life would have been so much easier with just five. <laughs> um, nine is quite a lot to watch when, you know, you're watching one of them and another one's going off to wee in the corner of the kitchen. <laughs> yeah, and on that point of having to watch my puppies, you know, how much work is it to actually have these puppies? Because if you've got nine puppies in your house, I mean, anyone that's listened to this that has got one puppy knows how difficult that is, but nine puppies, that is like a 24 seven responsibility that you've got to those little dogs. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. You, you, you've got to really have the time to do it. And we always made sure with that, each of those rotors that one of us were, were in and um, we didn't really leave them on their own at all. Well, a little bit. We obviously we left them not in the room. We were in the house, but we just didn't really leave the house uh, that much. You have to be, kind of give up your social life for eight weeks um you have to be prepared to you know introduce them to lots of things and make them be well-rounded pups you know different people children noises all sorts and you know we even had a few other dogs fully obviously fully health tested uh, fully vaccinated dogs um come in as well um so yeah we just it's the responsibility to make sure that they're well-rounded really and they're not you know, going to go to their new homes and be scared of everything that moves um so we did a lot of different things. We did a bit of crate training with them as well. Um, yeah, just, it, it is, so it's a lot of work and a lot of sleepless nights. And if you like your sleep, <laughs> don't breed. Um, it's, yeah, it, and it's just making sure that they're all happy and healthy. And also one of the biggest things was making sure Millie was okay as well, because you know, obviously people focus on these puppies, but Millie, we didn't really walk her at all for eight weeks. And that's her favorite thing is going out on walks. So it was hard for her, but she was obviously enjoying playing and having with the puppies, um, having time with them. But yeah, it's, it's just, you're constantly kind of thinking, you can't relax in, in a way because you're kind of always thinking about the puppies. Um, mm-hmm. it's, it's nice. It's such an amazing experience when, especially when you go in the pen and you sit with them and they all come and run and jump on you and bite your hair, bite everything you're wearing. And it's so nice. And to see all their little personalities grow is great as well. And I think you did such a good job with almost like you said about getting them well-rounded and socialization because you had people, you had children, you had dogs, you had loads of toys, you had hoovers, mops, all of these things that are in normal family home environments, which actually some little puppies never get exposed to for those first eight weeks because lots of kennel or barn puppies that literally get put in a barn for eight weeks with their mum just don't get exposed to these things and I've obviously got one of Millie's pups and it's made such a difference having a dog that's been exposed to that in the early stages and that's really important for me as a a puppy owner to know that my puppy would get that at the breeder so big well done for doing that and thank you because you've made my life much easier um so you've done all that stuff. Talk to me about collection day, because this is the bit where I would fail miserably, saying goodbye to all the puppies and kind of waving them off. How was collection day? Was it joy, sadness? What were you feeling like? It was a mixture of emotions because we'd had COVID all that week and I think I was exhausted from looking after puppies and now I'm having COVID. Um, but I woke up in the morning and it was kind of a day that you've, it's been in my mind for so long. I've been waiting for this day in like 
kind of wanting it to go slow, but we're also wanting it to go fast because obviously you're exhausted. Um, and, you know, by the time that the pups are kind of six weeks, seven weeks, they're very demanding. Um, and, you know, anyone who's got a one eight week old pup, can you imagine nine of them <laughs> all wanting your attention? Uh, it's a lot of work. But I think I said to myself, I wasn't going to cry because I'd already cried a few times. <laughs> Just thinking about them leaving, I'd cried. Um, and then I picked up the first puppy to go. Um, and I just started crying. So I had to pass her to Johnny <laughs> to give to the owner uh, because I just thought, oh gosh, I feel really upset now. But it, it, you, you feel upset because, you know, they've been your life for the for eight weeks and, you know, everything is revolved around them and you just want them to be happy and healthy. And it's also a bit of worry, but also then excitement as well, because, you know, they're going off to good homes. They're going off to have lots of fun and be the center of attention in this, in their new life. Whereas now they're kind of not because there's nine of them competing for attention. So, you know, they're going to get all the attention and love that, that, that they want. And yeah, they're going to have so many great experiences. And I guess it was kind of bittersweet for you as well, because you were saying goodbye to all the pups, but actually you kept one, didn't you? So did you always intend to keep one? And how did you decide which one you were keeping? We wanted to keep one, um, but we didn't know originally whether we were going to breed Millie once or twice. Um, so we thought if we breed her once, we definitely want to keep one from either litter. That's what we said to ourselves. And then when, when they, when she had eight, we had exactly the right number of people for boys and girls on the wait list. Um, so we thought, right, we won't keep one. And then a few hours later, number nine came that happened to be a girl and we wanted to keep a girl. Um, so I basically convinced myself it was fate. Um, (laughs) so that's why we kind of decided to keep one. And also as the process went on, um, it was amazing, but it was, you know, it's really hard work on Millie, on her body. And, you know, and we just thought maybe once is just enough for Millie. Um, she was an amazing mum, definitely. And, would, and she produced some lovely pups. So there isn't any reason why I wouldn't breed her again. It's just for us and for her, we think one, one litter is probably enough for anyone, especially if you've got nine. Maybe if she'd had a smaller litter, we would have thought differently. Um, but then when it came to choosing, it was there was kind of three pups that I was trying to choose between. And I was kind of, jo- Johnny had a favourite that wasn't, was it, that was in the three, but I was leaning towards the other two. And we just, in the end, I just decided to keep her because, basically because she was the last one out and we thought she was fate, it's meant to be. You can stay with us because you want, clearly wanted to be this prize and you wanted to stay. Um, so yeah, that's how we decided really. And also, I mean, I would have I would have actually kept any of them because they were all lovely. They were all really, you know, confident, playful pups. Um, any of them would have been amazing to keep. But yeah, it was a really hard decision. And how is Nancy getting on with Millie now? Are they kind of best mates already or is it still a, a work in progress? Oh, the thickest thieves. Uh, honestly, if if Nancy's up to something, Millie follows her. If if Millie sunbathes, Nancy sunbathes. If Millie goes to lie in her bed, Nancy does that. They just that Millie has now decided after nearly two years not being in a crate, she's like now decides she wants to go in a crate. Um, in Nancy's crate specifically. Um, so yeah, they, 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 they do everything together. It's really nice to see their relationship, but we're also conscious that we want to make sure they're having their own time as well. Um, and never competing for attention. So obviously Millie gets her walks separately. Nancy comes along to some of them, some of them, she stays at home. Um, which is making sure that they both got their, their, their own time. So Millie's allowed to, you know, have time away from Nancy upstairs um whenever she wants just so we don't feel like we're forcing them together um but at the moment they're getting on absolute great they're, they're really cute together um I think Nancy loves having her mum there all the time yeah must, must be really nice and reassuring for her because she's not had to go through all this turmoil of leaving everything she knows she's kind of stuck there with the people that have looked after her from day one so she must be feeling pretty good about that and what about all the other pups do you see them do you hear from them do you keep in touch with them and do you see that actually you will keep tabs on them for the rest of their life so to speak <laughs> yeah I think it's getting the balance between not being too intruding because they're obviously not your dogs anymore I'm not my dogs anymore um but I, I I love to see it updates obviously quite a few of them are on Instagram so I love seeing their updates my mum messages me especially about Ellie uh, nearly <laughs> every few days oh look what Ellie's been up to today Anna. Yeah, thank you mum I can see <laughs> I've been on Instagram too <laughs> um so yeah we love we love seeing the updates and also we've got a WhatsApp group um, with all the owners on where I kind of sent daily pictures really and, and videos and kind of all the information I sent on that group. And then 
I thought maybe we wouldn't use it anymore, but everybody wants to keep it open just to share progress pictures. And I met one of the pups, um, Aldo, at the weekend, and Nancy and Aldo had a good play for an hour. And well, that did them the world of good because they slept all afternoon, both of them. <laughs> did they remember each other, do you think? I, I think they did because especially Nancy was quite confident because she knew the garden we were in, but Aldo at first was a bit like, mm, where are we? And then after like one minute, they just, they were running around biting each other puppies play really nastily actually but <laughs> puppy play is something else you don't want to put your hand in the middle of it um but they they were having a great time millie was very uninterested she was sat with her ball not wanting to play in that i think she was enjoying the break actually um so yeah they had a great time and i'd like to meet up with the puppies in the future maybe when they're, they're a little bit older and they can do a, a good walk it'd be nice to meet some of them definitely Absolutely. Well, we're certainly going to make the journey to uh, to meet Nancy and Millie in the future, that's for sure. Um, so you've been through that process of breeding. Are you planning on doing it again? Would you do it again? Or is that kind of your your one shot now and you, you've done that? We, we, we're not going to do it again with Millie because she's getting spayed on Friday, actually. But uh, there isn't any reason for not really. It's just kind of timings. We're too a bit busy next year already to have a litter. And I don't really want to wait two years. Um to get her spayed um so yeah we're just we're getting her spayed I would potentially have a litter with Na- one litter with Nancy in the future um if she again it depends on her health tests her temperament how she kind of comes out because you know if she has any kind of undesirable characteristics or her health tests aren't good enough we wouldn't even think about breeding her um so that really depends so obviously keep the options open we won't we wouldn't get her spayed until she's a bit older anyway so we've got that option if, if we want it um but yeah I think being a breeder you have to be a certain type of person you have to be very tough um you have to be willing to put in the work and yeah and, and be okay with not having much sleep as well yeah that's the key part of it lack of sleep for eight weeks. um so one of the things that um lots of people ask is as someone that's buying a puppy they don't always know what to look for so they look on internet they look on different websites they see loads of puppies for sale now you've been a you've been a puppy buyer with millie and you've been a breeder, what advice would you give to someone that is looking to buy a puppy? What questions should they be asking of their breeder and what should they look for when they go and visit the puppies? Like a a given would be like, obviously all the health tests. Um, I would, like buying a dog dog now, I would want to meet the mum, either out on a walk or have some kind of information, more information about the mum. I think people often always focus on the puppies, but a lot of the puppies get the temperaments kind of from the mum and those in those first eight weeks they learn a lot from their mum so you want it to be you know a, a really good dog if you can um I would look in in a house you'd want to visit the house and make sure that you know they're making every conscious effort to try and make these pups part of the family part of their their lives so like we said before socializing them with things and people and you know even with the hoover now Nancy is not scared of the hoover at all like it does not bother her one bit. And you know, a lot of pups have issues with hoovers. <laughs> so it's just little things like that. It's just making sure that they're really well socialized. Um, and yeah, I think you just, I think for me, you want a breeder that isn't just doing it for the sake of breeding. They actually care about these puppies. And I think you can tell quite quickly whether a person is like that or not, um, just from speaking to them. And I know from my breeder, you can tell that she genuinely cared about everything and all the puppies and she loves the updates as well we were in contact with her still two years later um and meet for walks regularly and I think that's what you kind of want and also if if there's any other you know if you know any relations so if, if the mum has had a litter before what are those puppies like um because often you can't tell if the mum's had a first litter what the puppies are going to be like really um so if, if, if that's an option then you can always look at what 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 they've had previously and also you can't forget about the dad as well and make sure he's, you know, a good dog. And if there's any litters that he's sired, are they all healthy? That kind of thing. We did all sorts looking through um, health scores when we were on the kennel club website, we went to a lot of his litter to make sure they were all the litters he'd had to make sure they had good scores as well. The ones that had been scored. So it's just a a lot of different combinations, but I feel like you can get a feel for a person um, and what they're going to be like as a breeder. I think it's, it's, yeah, it's kind of figuring out, also what their motivations are so we can hear from well people listening will hear from you that you're you're passionate about Millie and giving the best things to her and her pups so there's nothing that suggests to me that you've done this purely for financial gain and I think there are a lot of breeders out there 
particularly during lockdown, we saw that, that actually it was quite a big motivation um, because actually there's so much work involved in it. Actually, there's it's life changing stuff for eight weeks. So it's um, it has to be something that you're very passionate about doing. There's going to be people listening to this that have got a dog at home and they think, actually, I've got a brilliant dog. She'd be a great mum. What advice would you give to them if they're thinking about mm. toying with the idea of breeding their dog? I think um, like just because you think they're going to be a great mum, does that actually mean that they will be? And are, are you willing to put in the work for eight weeks? Because it's not even eight weeks, actually. It's nine weeks of pregnancy before that, all the planning, everything you've got to do, because you know, you can't work, you can't leave the house every day and work from an office, you know, you've got to have that flexibility. So you've got to be in the right job really as well. Um, you've got to be willing to put in the work for the eight weeks. And then also afterwards as well, um, are you kind of doing everything correctly? I mean, there's, there's, I suppose there's no right and wrong really, but the way that I, I always do it is the way I would want a puppy and, you know, the things I'd want with it in terms of, worming vaccinations like puppy contracts that kind of thing you got to think are you prepared to do all that and are you prepared to spend all the money that is needed and also you know there could be any kind of things go wrong with the puppies and the mum you know they could have a c-section and that could cost thousands so are you willing to put in that work and you know the puppies might not even all survive it's horrible to say but it happens a lot and that's there's a lot there's a lot to think about and lots of things to worry about and I worried about Millie quite a lot for the first few weeks and I really I was really conscious that she was okay because you know they can get a lot of issues after they've given birth for example mastitis you know a lot a lot of issues and you just want to make sure that they're okay because Millie was obviously our one of our main priorities because you know she's our dog and we want anything to happen to her um and then you kind of get that guilt as well you feel oh I'll put her through this but you know at the end of the day she she loved it she was great um so yeah, I think the biggest advice is just, are you, are you willing to put in the work? Because it is a lot of work. Would you say, Anna, that there is a, a right time or a wrong time to, to breed your dog? Um, I think, well, because of COVID, there was an influx of litters. Um, everybody was breeding because there was such a huge demand for puppies. But I think now that's calmed down. I think you really need to look at the market to see, are puppies selling? Um, because if they're not, you could potentially end up with nine puppies you know if I didn't have enough buyers I could have ended up with nine puppies and it would be my responsibility to keep them all um so you have to be really do your research and look to see whether um there are a lot of lists out there and how quickly these puppies are going you know if they're still there if they've still people have still got puppies at eight to ten weeks that shows that they're not going very quickly and the market is too full so just definitely look at that aspect as well and I think as well as a buyer when you want a puppy you want a puppy at eight nine weeks old if you can if you're finding a breeder that's got a puppy left at 12, 13, 14 weeks, that would actually put a lot of people off and you might get lumbered with this beautiful puppy, but actually no one wants. And you spoke about COVID there as well. You would have thought puppies were gold plated during COVID because the price was astronomical. Um, that's not necessarily a true reflection of today's puppy market, is it? No, it's not. Definitely the price has come down massively. Um and it's very expensive to breed as well. So you just need to make sure that you've got all the costs covered and eventualities that you could have surprise costs as well. And also um, you experienced something with one of the pups coming back to you. And I know in your puppy contracts, it says if you can't keep the dog or, or situations change, that they're to bring the dog back to you because you want to make sure that they're, they're cared for well. So you've actually got a lifelong commitment to nine dogs now, right? F effectively, yes. And I they don't, people don't always put that in their contract, but... I feel such a responsibility to these puppies that I put in the contract that if if you ever need to rehome your puppy, well, hopefully it would be a dog at that point, or or you know not at all, ideally, um, you would contact me first. And you know we had that where one of the puppies came back to us after three days, which was honestly so stressful and upsetting. Um, it really kind of took me by surprise because you do everything you can to find the best owners. And then when a pup comes back to you, you start kind of questioning everything. And and obviously it was just one of those really unfortunate things. And it wasn't anything to do with the pup, just circumstances of the family that had that had him. Um, he's in a much, be much better home now, I think, for him. He's really enjoying it. Um, we get to see lots of his updates. And but for me, I wouldn't want 
a, a dog, you know, the, there's a lot of dogs out there, a lot of rescues in centres and they're overcrowded. And the last thing I would want is for any dogs to end up in a rescue. I would much rather take them back, either find them a home myself or keep them. Oh, Johnny wouldn't be very impressed if we ended up with a lot, nine dogs. But um, but yeah, that, that, that that's the idea, really. I, I just think I've got such a responsibility for them. I brought them into the world. So, you know, I just, if anything did happen, touch wood, it won't, then hopefully the owners will contact me first. Yeah, definitely. What was your, um, what was the best thing about breeding Millie? Just pick one thing and it can be any part of the process. What what was your kind of never forget um, moment? There's, there's two things, I think. The, the, the first one is, I remember one morning, I just, I came down, I sat in the pen and they all just jumped on me and Millie came too. And I just thought, oh, this is the best thing ever. <laughs> How can you be sad when you've got nine puppies and, and Millie all trying to come to you? Um, it's just the bond that they have with me and with Johnny because we were looking after them 24 seven they had such an attachment to us by the end and you know they would follow me around everywhere and just like we had nine shadows literally um that was such a uh, amazing really just that they, they how much they loved you um and then the other moment is when you see them so happy in their new homes you, you see lots of updates you think it's all worth it all the stress the worry is all worth it because the new owners are happy and that, that's what you want as well you want the kind of owners and families to be happy with their puppy and the puppy to have the best life and kind of get everything that they want out of life um so yeah that that's for me those two things are the biggest things brilliant and um people can't see this but you've got a smile on your face when you talk about these puppies so I know it's going to be happy memories that live with you forever um but hindsight is also pretty good um what would you have done differently is there anything that kind of you look back and think I wish I'd have done that differently or next time I might do it in a different way I think the only thing I did differently was probably stress a bit less at, at certain times because sometimes I felt so stressed by everything that we had to do that I was like, oh, just this is, I, I can't believe we've done this. Why have we done this? I questioned it quite a few times. I thought, what have we got ourselves into? And I just thought, I, I and it, it's easy to do that because, you know, first time doing anything, you feel a bit like on edge and nervous. Um, but for me, it was just just relax a bit more next time go along with the flow obviously do everything we did this time but just relax into it a little bit more okay um do you regret anything anything that you did or didn't do do you kind of look back and go just just shouldn't have done it I don't think so no I did like we did a lot of research um a lot of preparation probably too much to be fair but and I don't think I regret anything we did I think I think I've been really happy with how everything's turned out. Obviously, it wasn't ideal one of the puppies coming back, but I don't regret that because I think he's in a better home now. Yeah, I've certainly seen pictures and videos of him in his new home and he's he's having a great time with his big brother, isn't he? Yeah. Um, okay, so people that have listened to this that are considering breeding their dog, what is your final kind of message that you want to leave them with? I know you're going to say that it's, it's hard work. Is it kind of go out and do it or is it actually think about it think about it again, have a chat, think about it again. I think it's definitely think about it. Speak to people that have done it, um, get advice before you do it. It isn't something you just go and do, definitely. You have to do a lot of preparation. You have to be prepared for everything. And you have to be prepared for, you know, potentially things to be really sad as well. And are you going to be able to cope with that? Because things could have gone very differently for us. And, you know, thank thank God they didn't, but they could have. And that would have been, I don't know how I would have coped with that, to be honest. You have to be very hardy in that, those kind of situations. Be prepared for every eventuality and really think think about it properly and make sure that you've got that support as well. Um, I think that's a big thing. We had a lot of family support that could help us if we needed to go out or you know if we needed to do anything. And if I went into the office, we had siblings that would come around and watch the puppies. You've not got that support network then as well, being stuck in the house with eight puppies is quite isolating. Uh, so as lovely as puppies are, you know, they can't talk back. Um, so just making sure that you, you, you've thought about it and you've got everything you need. And where can people um, find out a bit more about these two wonderful dogs that you've got? So where can, I, where can they kind of go to follow Millie and Nancy? Their Instagram is Millie Fox Red Lab, but I probably need to change that actually now I've got Nancy. Um, she might feel a bit left out now. <laughs> um, <laughs> 
Yeah, but for now, Millie Fox Red. So um, there's lots of pictures of, of Millie and um, and Nancy on there as well. Um, Anna, thank you so much from me and the rest of the listeners. Um, I do hope that you, Millie and Nancy, just continue to have the absolute best time together. And I'm sure you will. Um, folks that are listening, remember to give Millie and Nancy a follow on Instagram. And I'll be back in a few weeks for the next episode. Thanks for joining us. We hope that has been useful to you. But from me, all I want to finish off by saying is be caring, be consistent and be your Labrador's best teacher. I'll catch you on the next episode.